Hello again, Janelia, and welcome back to the science of COVID-19. Uh, today we are extremely happy to have as our guest uh, Rob Phillips, a professor of biophysics and biology at Caltech. Rob and I share a little bit in common, uh, and that is that uh, this is not our day job, um, but he has stepped up to the plate and is applying uh, the principles of math, physics, uh, statistics to the crisis that is paralyzing humanity right now. And today he is going to give us a talk uh, entitled, Where is Euler Now That We Need Him? Which I haven't asked, but I assume is a reference to the seven bridges of Königsberg. So uh, Rob, take it away. Thanks. Just one sec while I get myself set up here. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great privilege to be here amongst you. And um, and I know I have many friends at Janela and HHMI, and I hope that I'll hear from some of you afterwards. Um, just to confirm to Lauren or somebody, can you make sure that you guys can hear me okay? Is it all good? Yep. Great, thank you. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you a perspective from the, what I like to refer to as the by the numbers perspective. And so over the last 20 years uh, with my friends, uh, Julie Terrio, Yane Kondev, Ernan Garcia, Ron Milo, Christina Hishan, Abby Flamholtz, and Yunon Baran, we've been engaged in uh, trying to come up with all sorts of different ways to hold up biology to the the angle of biological numeracy. So there's a, num a website that probably some of you know about, which is the BioNumbers website. And a few weeks back, uh, Yinon and Avi, Ron and I put out this short piece, which is called SARS-CoV-2 by the numbers, and was our attempt to come to terms with what has been, the, has been discovered thus far about this virus. So just as a little background, <clears throat> as I said, I've been very interested in the by the numbers approach as it pertains to molecular and cell biology, developmental biology. But as time has gone on, we've become more and more interested in sort of a broader view. And one of the things that, that Ron and Yunon and I did a few years ago in a paper in PNS was to think about the biomass distribution on Earth. And the reason in the bottom left I'm showing Sean Carroll is just to say that I've been deeply inspired by his uh, his efforts in the name of ecology, uh, HHMI, and I use it in my teaching all the time, and at least I'm one of the, the, the case studies where that sort of outreach has been enormously important. Our efforts in human impacts by the numbers have sort of been broad and wide, and that's probably a story for another day, but just to try to tell you, we've been thinking really hard about the way that humans have impacted planet Earth from all sorts of different perspectives, food, water, air, pollution, flora, fauna, keystone species, extinctions, etc. cetera. So, um, so what I want to do now is I want to I try to make the argument that SARS-CoV-2 is not just a word story, but it's also a numbers story. There's lots of numbers that really matter, and I'm sure there's many of you on this call that have been quite aware of the unfolding polemic that surrounded the question of how many people harbor antibodies and the question of false positives, two studies that were frontline newspaper items within 24 hours of preprints being on, online, you know, something that's something for all of us to think about. But issues like the asymptomatic fraction, infection probability, and so on. And I'm going to try and make this argument, I mean, I'm using these words viral mechanics intentionally because I want to make an analogy today with classical mechanics in the context of planetary motion. Why by the numbers? The, the, I think this was best articulated by Darwin in his autobiography, where he referred to people that used mathematics as having what he referred to as an extra sense, that you could see things that could not be seen otherwise. And, you know, I might have the history wrong, but I can tell you in the context of super resolution microscopies, you know, that there have been a lot of theoretical insights that help push that forward. In the cases that I show you here, I'm very interested, for example, in the bar-tailed godwits. These are birds that migrate 10,000 kilometers nonstop on a 10-day journey. And if you're quantitative about it, you can try to estimate what their mass loss is as a function of the distance flown. In the upper right, this goes all the way back to Galileo and has to do with the size of legs and what they have to do with the size of bodies and ultimately the buckling force that those, uh, those legs will suffer. So the, the outline of my talk goes something like follows. I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about the virus 
and from the by the numbers perspective this is background material and then i'll talk a little bit about this at the scale of individual humans but the majority of what i want to say uh, is the last part which has to do with making dynamics real and will explain my title where is euler now that we need him i did want to say that this is slightly awkward uh, it's awkward in the sense that, of course, I would be very happy to have been on an airplane and have flown to, to, um, to Dulles and to have taken a car out to Janelia and talked about the things that I've been working on that I'm very excited about that have to do with active matter and genomes, and etc. But instead, what I'm going to talk to you about is the coronaviruses and from the by the numbers point of view. But, you know, I, I have to say that it's not really something where I've been sitting around for the last five years thinking about something that I'm now going to tell you. It's, it's really an attempt to come to terms with the facts. So, and if somebody wants to engage me on this question of the bioarchive and their views about review articles and factual papers, I, I can't tell you how vehemently I disagree with their policies. So, um, I'm gonna start with just a little bit of a, a background on the history of how we came to know about viruses because I find it amusing. And so I won't spend any time on this other than, than to say that there's pathogens over link scales ranging from one meter all the way down to you know 10 nanometer a link scale of polio virus. But what I, what I do wanna comment on is the rise of the so-called germ theory of disease in the hands of people like Pasteur and Koch. So Pasteur had been contacted by breweries and wineries in France and the reason was there were contaminants in their, in their wines and, and beers. And he had this realization that they were infected basically by microbes. And this led him to a point of view in which he imagined that maybe the putrefaction of meat, but even more importantly, human health was tied in turn to a kind of microbial contamination. And, you know, if you turn to the pages of Le Monde in the morning, you'll see that the word that they use in French for in the, the, what's going on right now is contamination. Um, Coke and Pasteur both pursued relentlessly the cholera, just for example. They, they went to Egypt and then to India, their grad students did. And Koch, at the end, articulated what many of you know as his postulates. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the basic idea is you have to be able to harvest from the infected organism, the microorganisms of interest, you have to be able to grow them and culture them, reinfect a second um, organism, and then culture them again. That brings us to, let's say, 1890. And in 1890, a new class of pathogens arose, and that's viruses. And I want to just say a few words about that. So as good microbiologists, Dmitry Ivanovsky and Martinez Beyerink, they had both been approached by tobacco growers. And there were blights on their plants, and they undertook exactly the same kind of study using filters, the kind of filters that will get rid of things that are one micron sized and larger. And the thing that surprised them is that they find that the, they found that the, the flow through, the liquid that had flown through these filters was still infectious. So if you look at Bayerink's papers, you will see that he used some Latin name, which I can't even pronounce, but uh, some sort of fluidum or something. Um, and so he posited a new kind of infectious agent, which are viruses. And it, that has come to be known as the tobacco mosaic virus, which I think of as being the hydrogen atom or one of the key hydrogen atoms of virology. And I just wanted to tell you about two of my favorite papers uh, that come from this episode. The first one is this 1955 paper by Frankel Conrad, in which what they did is they took the purified RNA and the purified proteins on the right, the lower right, you see purified protein only. And it's interesting because those, those viruses or pseudoviruses are heterogeneous in their lengths. They have indeed self-assembled in the context of the laboratory but they were not infectious. And that was not known in 1955. You know, this is not that far behind Hershey and Chase's experiment. It's only a couple years after Watson and Crick. And they still were working out what is the nature of the infectious agents of viruses. And they came to realize that it was the RNA. The part that I like the best, you know, it's not going to help us in any way necessarily solve anything about coronavirus, but I just love this experiment in which um, the basically by electron microscopy, as shown in the middle, what they did is they measured the length of RNA dangling out of the, the, the nascent capsid, and they plotted, as you see on these two plots, the length of the tail and the length of the particle. And so the idea is, if you like, that the, the protein co-assembles with, um, with the RNA, and the longer the thing gets, the less, the less of a tail you have until it, it basically has served as a tape measure, and you have the complete assembly. You can see that there's a short tail dangling out, its length doesn't change. So that also led to some insights into the nature of assembly. 
I wanted to make a comment about this. So we, uh, 15 years ago, actually got interested in the question of the difference between uh, pressurized viruses and those that have no internal pressure. So if you look at lambda phage or 529, the reason I got interested in viruses in the first place is a single molecule experiment done in the group of, of Carlos Bustamante, where using optical tweezers, they measured the force buildup as the DNA was packed into the capsid. And the analogy I like is that it's like taking 500 meters of Golden Gate Bridge cable and putting it in the back of a FedEx truck. It's the right dimensions, it's the right aspect ratio, it's the right stiffness. And so what I want you to see here is the column labeled efficiency. This tells you the volume fraction taken up by the internal genetic material, either the RNA or the DNA. And I want you to notice the huge difference, for example, between lambda phage at the top and SARS and HIV at the bottom, where this tells me that in the case of these phages, there is ATP consuming reactions that allow you to get to these very high packing ratios. The thing that I was showing you in the context of tobacco mosaic virus is it also true for um, SARS coronavirus, influenza and others, is it's not an ATP consuming thing, but you can think of it as a down, free energy downhill reaction. So with that as my background, um, now I'm just gonna say a few words from the by the numbers perspective. So this is a couple of uh, paintings made by David Goodsell. Surely most of you are, are familiar with him. On the right is the influenza virus, one of my all time favorite challenges in all of biology, which is the question of how do those eight separate RNA molecules get within the virion. People like TJ Ha have done very interesting experiments in which they've actually measured the, um, the fidelity of the RNA molecules that get into the virions. And on the left, you see the, the SARS coronavirus where there's one very long um, RNA molecule. One of the things that I've been quite interested in and that came up as we were putting together our by the numbers piece on the SARS-CoV-2 was the claim, the original claims about the size, which said that it was between 60 and 140 nanometers. And I found that kind of frustrating. And so um, we convinced Elizabeth Fisher and Emmy DeWitt to give us some of their images. And then we basically did an image analysis to figure out the distribution of sizes. And you can see it's much narrower, but it is a little bit heterogeneous. And that made me think of one of my favorite studies done on heterogeneity, something that I think is absolutely critical for viruses. It was done by Grant Jensen at Caltech, where he did cryo-electron microscopy to look at the heterogeneity of different HIV variants. The reason that's important to me is that um, any model of assembly of viruses must respect the fraction of those viruses that do not complete to a proper, let's say, perfect uh, assembly. And so what he did is try to take stock of that. I think it's still true that we don't know what fraction of those variants are infectious. So what about what's inside of the virus? So as surely most of you know, we have RNA viruses, we have DNA viruses. You can see the lower right example on the RNA virus is the schematic that I'm gonna use for coronavirus. And the thing that, that impresses me is that if you had been living in 1665 in Cambridge, um, England, as was Isaac Newton, you would have basically been sent home for uh, physical distancing, just like we are. And it was during those several years that Isaac Newton figured out the calculus, he figured out the law of gravitation, the second law of motion, etc. But why do I bring it up? I bring it up because whether it was 1850 and it was the, uh, the arrival of cholera on the shores of England or it's 1665, you had no idea what was happening to you. And even in 1918, if you read the history of the great influenza in the great book by Barry, you will see that the doctors, even the doctors, the medical professionals, did not at first understand that it was a virus. So what amazes me is that in the last few months, we now have more than 4,000 copies of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. You know, we have this giant encyclopedia. There's 1.5 billion copies worth of Shakespeare uh, in the NIH databases of genomic information. And just to give you an impression about the size, um, here I show a scale uh, image of the virus and its genome. Just remember that the genome is around 30,000 nucleotides long, a third of a nanometer per nucleotide. That tells you 10,000 nanometers or 10 microns. That's the size of the genome in comparison with the measly 100 nanometer size of the viral particle itself. So um, as all of you know, and as I think is a fascinating story that's unfolding on the pages of the New York Times in front of our eyes, um, People have been sequencing these genomes. And again, I'm using a graphical representation, a bit like what you would find on the Next Strain website to illustrate the accumulation of mutations over time. 
Now, one of the most interesting things about biology writ large, as far as I'm concerned, but for sure about this virus, is it has a proofreading um, mechanism. And so on the left, I give you my spin on the idea of genomic copying, where you have a genome, you want to copy it. I want you to think of the copying as being the flipping of a very dishonest coin. One in 10 to the sixth times that you throw the coin, will you get a tail? And that will lead to a mismatch, an incorrect copy. But in this case, there's an exonuclease which actually serves to repair those errors. What's shown in the graph on the right is the difference between the wild type and a knockout in terms of number of mutations. This is, as you notice from the date, this is not the current uh, SARS coronavirus, but the, the previous one. So, um, so the Next Strain website is truly fascinating and really interesting to spend time on. You can click on different viruses. You can find out what the nucleotide and the amino acid mutations are. I would be very happy, actually, if, a few, if we could do a few things, and probably there is a way to do it. Um, just a trivial one is that, unfortunately, as you can see on the x-axis on the left, despite having a grid, the spacing between the points, the dates, are not equal. And I find that kind of frustrating. Um, the y-axis shows you the number of mutations over time. And clearly the colors are going to tell you about geographic locale. Let me just go forward so you see that. So purple is China, red is the United States, green and yellow are in Europe. And so if you look at this, I just tried for the purposes of giving you an impression, a crude estimate, where what I do is on the left, I just say, well, okay, there's been on the order of eight mutations over a four month period. And I can then compute uh, a, a mutation uh, on a per site basis per year. Doing the same thing on the right yields a, about a five-fold higher um, a set of mutations. But again, it would be nice to do this um, with only the neutral mutations. So that's kind of by way of background on the virus. Now, let me just say a few words about, um, about things that might amuse you. There's all sorts of interesting experiments that are being run at this point. A lot of them have a lot of uncertainty that I think is important for us to uh, bear in mind. And um, so the point here is, is just to note, as everybody knows, there's different points of viral entry and the coronavirus is a respiratory virus. And so a lot of what's discussed, it doesn't matter whether it's in the context of scientific discussions or at the podium at the White House is the question of transmission. And so here I'm showing you the slide simply in case anybody wants to go do their own detective work. Uh, this is a very nice experiment that was done by the same people that uh, did the electron microscopy that I showed you earlier. And if you trace their references, you will find that they've done extremely interesting experiments on MERS and the previous SARS as well, and also influenza. So what they, uh, I, I've just digested, it's a very complicated data set that looked at copper and steel and cardboard and plastic, and they looked at aerosols and, and so on. But um, all that I'm trying to convey here is the idea that the concept of the experiment is to measure the viral titer as a function of time. And you can see that they make a comparison. The x-axis on the top is in uh, you know, days time scale. On the, on the bottom, it's hours time scales. Those are log scales on the y-axis. And the intent is just to, to give us an impression about the, the dying off over time. But you know, there's a key thing here, which remains to some extent quite unknown. And so what I did um, here was on the left to just take the numbers that are coming out of the UCSF Ch uh, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub world, which is the world I hang out in, about the viral loads. So I want you to imagine 10 to the fourth to 10 to the eighth per ml. And so if I take those numbers and convert them into the number of virions per 100 micron droplet, it will range between as few as a few all the way up to a few times 10 to the fourth. On the right, um, I'm just giving you an impression of the kinds of things that are known, and often they are not known in absolute units, I'm afraid. They're often known in units of tissue culture infectious dose, but I want to know them in absolute units, for my, at least for my own amusement. So with polio, you see that a very low dose suffices to engender uh, an infection, and with influenza, the numbers are between 500 and 3,000. And for this crowd, I thought it might be just amusing for us all to remember some of the really fun aspects of biology have to do with detection limits. So, um, so here I'm showing you things that I'm sure many of you know way, way better than I do, but some of my favorites, 
uh, in the upper left is some classic experiments that had to do with uh, basically putting subjects in uh, in dark rooms and then basically trying to figure out uh, what the threshold number of photons was. Uh, the next one down is, if I remember from Baylor and, um, and others, where they were looking at um, single photoreceptor responses. On the right is stuff from Jim Hudspeth that has to do, I love these experiments. They're really, really my, some of my favorites, classics, where you use a um, capillary probe to perturb the hair cells, the stereocilia, and then they're also doing um, electrical measurements simultaneously. And then on the bottom is the one I guess I know some, something substantial about is detection limits for chemoreceptors. So there, you know, what we're thinking of is a bacterium that's moving in a concentration gradient. And the thing that I guess I would like to convey is that a bacterium, you can change the background concentration by a factor of 10,000 and it will still be able to detect the same 0 0.02 um, micromolar per micron concentration gradient against all those different backgrounds. So just to come back to this, you know, the question of what is what constitutes an infectious dose is, I think, a, a quite interesting question. And you know, the the KDs of the interaction of uh, the spike protein with um, the ACE2 receptor are very low uh, in, in an interesting way. And I think there's lots of things to, to think about there. This is my attempt to channel actually uh, an art I, I personally liked, although some of my friends didn't like it by Carl Zimmer um, from the New York Times. Um, and it's just to try for people that aren't used to thinking about viral life cycles to get a little bit of a sense of how this plays out. So, you know, the virus binds and um, then the genome is released and the cell now with, with that Trojan horse, uh, the soldiers released, the new proteins are made, the viral genome is copied, and then this thing assembles. And again, I wanna leave people with the impression that from a scientific point of view, the question of viral assembly is such a wonderful question. And um, there's a really beautiful experiment that was done by Vinnie Manahoran at Harvard that was in PNAS that I really recommend to you. I think it was looking at the assembly Single, you know, single molecule experiments where they're looking at the assembly of MS2, uh, which is kind of funny because you know it's also a great live imaging tool for uh, for gene expression measurements. But it's a it's a really wonderful model system for viruses. So again, to come back to my earlier slide of DNA pressurized viruses versus those that that are free energy minima, if you'll let me use those words loosely, um, is really an interesting point. So um, so now um, I'm going to get to the last part. And I think I'm doing fine on time. So, um, so where is Euler now that we need him? So let, let me try to elaborate on that. And, and I'm gonna go at a little bit of a slower pace now, uh, given that I do have enough time. And I hope you'll bear with me uh, for, but just patiently because of my love of celestial mechanics, but also because I think that it's extremely relevant to what's happening before our eyes right now. So, um, so the story I wanna comment on is two, of the famous three body problems. So one of them is the problem of the moon, the earth, and the sun. And that was something that was deeply on Isaac Newton's mind when he wrote the Principia in 19, or 1687. And, uh, but also the three body problem of Jupiter, Saturn, and the sun. And that one was on the minds of Laplace and Lagrange as they tried to address this, the question of the stability of the, st the solar system. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. And I guess this will be my only, well, maybe my second opportunity for a rant. My first one was very, very tame, uh, but critical, strongly critical of BioArchive for its policy about review articles and so-called facts-only articles, of which I'm a big fan. Um, this one's a stronger rant. And this is the rant against the, what I could think of as the hegemony of surprise in modern biology. And what I want to say is this was a hundred year topic and it was not a surprise topic. Nobody was in the business of surprise. Uh, I find surprise to be way overrated and a bit uh, consumed with human vanity. So there, that's as much as I will permit myself to say and I probably pissed some people off and I'm happy to debate it with anybody. So the three body problem. So what was the issue? The issue is that every time the moon goes around the earth, the, the long axis of its elliptical orbit it rotates a little. It rotates by about three degrees. So that means that over the course of a year, it rotates by about 40 degrees. And um, Newton himself had calculated this. 
Newton had also calculated the speed of the sound. I just want to tell you, you know, there were two problems that he could not solve. This was one of them, and the other one was the speed of sound. And it took, it took uh, both times about 100 years, and in both cases it was Laplace who figured it out. So Laplace figured out the difference between isothermal and adiabatic expansion of air, and that cured the problem with the mismatch between theory and experiment on the speed of sound. And Laplace figured out how to think about these problems in celestial mechanics. But okay, so I've told you the problem. It may sound obscure, but it's no more obscure than the problem of um, how many people are going to die in New York uh, in the coming weeks, in my opinion. So people tackled this. And for 30 years, people like Euler and Clairol and D'Alembert worked really hard on this problem. And you know, in case you don't know about Euler, he's basically the most prolific mathematician in history. You can find all of his works online. Uh, you know, we don't go to libraries anymore, but the way I want you to imagine the complete works of Euler is that he had, when you go into a library and you go to, I always like to go to the QC section, which is physics, and you look at it, the shelf is about, you know, a meter wide, and there's, I would say, six or seven shelves, and his complete works takes more than that, and people are still trying to figure out all the stuff that he wrote. It's also interesting that he was blind the last 20 years of his life and he didn't miss a beat. He just kept on humming. So these three guys were interested in the question of the, the position of the moon and the motion of this. Uh, I'm going to keep using the, the notion of the semi-major axis. The reason they could get to the point of caring about this is that the data was good enough. The data, the astronomical data became sufficiently good that it became possible to ask these questions. And I will note, you know, the last few years, the Nobel Prizes in physics have exactly been on one of these questions of can you make a good enough measurement? So the discovery of exosolar planets was dependent on making a one in 10 to the six type shift in um, light wavelengths, if I remember correctly. The LIGO experiment at Caltech was about measuring some number uh, in terms of displacements that I don't even, I'm embarrassed to even say the words because I'm, I'm worried that I'll misquote it, but it's something like 10 to the minus 19. So you had to be able to make the measurements. So the measurements have been made, and now they wanted to find out, did the law of gravitation work or not? And there were small discrepancies. In fact, the discrepancies led them, and I'm showing you this in the lower right, both Euler and D'Alembert, because we see the same face of the moon all the time, they actually worked out a dumbbell model in which there was a second mass behind the one that we see. And so, you know, I think it's important to say that Euler, he uh, submitted his uh, work in many of these prizes, the Berlin Academy of Sciences, and like the, I think the Parisian one, at Net, the one in Paris, he often won. And his work on this problem won a prize, and more or less everything about his results was wrong. And if you want to read about this further, the, the, probably the preeminent figure in this world is a guy called Jack Lasker. Uh, he, he gives great talks, which you can see online, and this article is really one of my favorites. Um, Lagrange tackled the same problem, and he also got it wrong, but this is the paper in which he formulated uh, the, the matrix equation dx by dt is ax. In other words, when we learn how to solve differential equations using eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it first appeared in this context. And what I want to say is that, uh, you know, if you fast forward another couple hundred years, Caltech will send out an email like the one that you see here. I just grabbed it this morning from my email. It's June 1st, 2012. And what they said was, hey, come on over to the athletic field because at such and such a time, um, we will have a transit of Venus across the sun. And so uh, we went over there and oddly, <laughs> to, oddly to me, uh, the picture of the two people you see on the right, that's my daughter, Molly and her soon to be husband Scott and you know they they showed up because we we trusted the email you know that people knew what they were talking about and so this is kind of the end of my introduction to the where is Euler now that we need him part of my talk which is that now we can count on celestial mechanics to tell us uh, what time an eclipse will be what how high the tide will be in four years at Ventura Point at 4.30 a.m. on December 24th or whatever. And, um, and so now, in light of that, let's talk about viral mechanics. So, um, so my, my thought here is that we live in a viral world. And the easiest way for me to point that out to you is to think about 
uh, the top 200 meters of the ocean. If you go out into the ocean and you grab one cubic centimeter of water, what you'll find is on the order of 10 to the sixth bacteria. And as I show you in the lower right, there's this notion of what's called the virus to bacterium ratio. And in general, it's 10 to one. And you can see that if you go over to six on the x-axis and go up to the middle of the blue bob blob, that will take you to seven roughly. So that's 10 to the seventh viruses per 10 to the sixth bacteria. The number of gigatons of carbon associated with all the bacteria on Earth is around 70 gigatons. And that corresponds to about five times 10 to the 29th bacteria. And there's about tenfold more bacteriophages. And even in an infected patient, as I told you a little while ago, there's between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the eighth SARS-CoV-2s per ml. So what I wanna talk about now is this issue of uh, the, the bonanza of the wild, what I would call the wild, wild west of our science right now. And that was the headline on LA Times yesterday morning, not about models, but rather about antibody testing, but the same can be said about models. So what are people up to and what are they trying to accomplish? So what I would say is that of course, there's all sorts of different motivations in play, but one of the things people are trying to do is they're trying to understand what's over the horizon. And the way they're doing that is a few different schemes. One of the scheme, sets of schemes is empirical fits. And I've shown you a couple of examples on the left, the logistic growth equation, which is a sigmoidal curve. People have used Hill functions, people have used Fermi functions, used error functions as I show you in the lower left. On the right-hand side, I'm trying to convey that there's a parallel universe of people that are trying to make me mechanistic or semi-mechanistic mean field models, stochastic simulations, and so on, to try to figure out what's uh, what's over the horizon. So that's the starting point. Um, as probably all of you know, the Institute in Washington that um, I think is run by Chris Murray, and that's somebody definitely worth reading about. I, if you haven't read it before, there's a very interesting book about him called Epic Measures uh, that I really think is worth our time to consider um, and led to his introduction with his team of the notion of the disability adjusted life year and trying to take stock of people's health. So. Um, this model has had a lot of reach. It definitely is in the halls of power and is being used to make projections and, and is behind words of people that we see on the news. And, um, and so just to reiterate, what's the idea in a nutshell? It's a three parameter model, if you want to call it a model, I call it maybe a three parameter fit, where um, there's, a there's an N max, which is the, the saturation, and then there's a, an initial time point, which I will call tau. And then there's a width to this thing, which I'm gonna to refer to as sigma. And all I really wanted to tell you is that this can be used either for forecasting or for time, trying to replay the tape of the pandemic. And so uh, Pankaj Mehta and Bobby Marsland, I think have, in my opinion, done the most careful job of, of just trying to assess what this thing says. And in fact, yesterday we made a bet of a dinner in Paris if we ever get to go there again, because my argument was that I'm betting that the, um, the lower right, Florida, is not gonna be right over the long haul, but we'll see. So, um, so at any rate, that's the, that's the idea of these kinds of things, is trying to look over the horizon. And if I were to try to summarize for you, if, if you wanted to take away the nugget of these kinds of, of um, fits, it would be, um, and this was known already, there was a Chinese group that did a very interesting preprint more than a month ago um, in which they made the comment that if you're not past the inflection point in terms of when you use data to make your fit, the fit will fail. So that's the, that's the summary statement. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So uh, the mathematics of viral spread has really deep roots. So already, uh, as you can see on the right, um, the Daniel Bernoulli, um, gave us a new analysis on the mortality caused by smallpox and of the advantages of vaccines for, for preventing it, is what it's called. And then in 1927, Kermack and McKendrick um, wrote a paper, which we now kind of uh, call the, the SIR model. And I just want to give you a broad brushstroke impression of what these models are up to. Um, the idea is to separate the population into different categories, susceptible, infected, exposed, recovered, hospitalized, quarantined, you know, whatever. Uh, I just want to show you, I, I'm aware of, you know, at the bottom right, 
I'm showing you one of many examples of the kind of models that people are writing down. And, um, and then you can calculate, there's some parameters. There's a parameter that tells you about the rate of converting susceptibles into infected, the rate of converting infected into recover, recovered and so on. And the kind of curves that come out of these are shown on the, the bottom. And I wanna make sure that you don't leave my talk with a mistaken impression. If we were to plot the curves on the bottom for the US or for California or for Los Angeles, what that curve would look, the green curve would be a horizontal line and the red curve would be a horizontal line basically at zero. What I'm trying to say is that the pool of susceptibles has not changed particularly. And, you know, in the most uh, large estimate, I would say it would be like 4% of the population, something like that. These models have all sorts of questionable assumptions, like well-mixed uh, population, where, you know, I'm big on lattice models, um, as people that have been with me at MBL know. And so a lattice model, you, you imagine, you know, susceptible people and infected people, and you ask the probability they end up in the same square, and then there's a probability of infection if they are in the same square. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with uh, this exponential growth stuff, other than to say, you know, that the Johns Hopkins website is an interesting place to kind of keep track and I've been just taking snapshots over the last two or three weeks and uh, you know you know what's going on. So um, I want to I want to just say again something about the status of these models. So um, you can use them to replay the tape. So what I'm showing you the dark brown region on the left is the region that's used to make the fit and then the stuff on the light tan on the right is the projection or the prediction and that's one example of replaying the pandemic. I like this one even more. So this is kind of straight up using one of these uh, sophisticated SIR models where you use the region on the left, you had not yet passed the inflection point, and you can see that the, um, that the predictions fall, for, fall sh far short of what one would hope. Um, I should have put a reference to this. This is by Susan Manrubia, and it's just a, it's a nice recent paper. Um, that if I understand correctly, actually got maybe rejected from one of the archives, which I think is a pity, but we'll see. Um, uh, I, this is just in passing. I just want to come back to my disclaimer. We've been messing around with a lot of data, trying to understand things. This, this pertains to the question of whether or not there are super spreaders. So clearly, for those of you that are old enough to remember, in the context of HIV, there was one uh, Air Canada flight attendant, if I remember correctly, that was really promiscuous. And viciously promiscuous by even once he knew that he was infectious he kept on um, doing it what the graph on the right is just trying to show you that uh, some small fraction of the population is responsible for um, 68 percent of the transmissions this also shows you the utility of contact tracing if you look at the spreadsheets that are available for that the data from places like korea and japan uh, and singapore it's much more enlightening than the data that we're getting so I just want to finish on the note of ending the lockdown. Um, I just have a few things to say. And again, the vast majority of what I'm telling you about is not stuff that I've done myself. It's not a research talk in that sense of the word. So I hope you'll be a, a little bit generous with me and don't shred me. Um, I'm just trying to report what my coronavirus discussion group has unearthed and my best current understanding of the state of the art. So. Um, so we're in a lockdown right now. A very small fraction of our population, despite the tragic consequences, has been infected thus far. And so we're now proposing to open up for business. And, um, you know, you would like to be on the other side of the, this infection curve, which, you know, in many cases we're not, but that's another story. So what I want to do is I want to tell you about two papers in particular that, that I suggest you go take a look at. I'm not saying these are the be-all, end-all, but after months now of trying to study the literature and think about exponential and power law growth and understanding what's going on, these are two of the, the examples of the cream that has come to the top. So the first one is by a Swiss group, and what they have been interested in doing is uh, 15,000 daily random tests. The population of Switzerland is around 8 million, and so that tells you if we wanted to do this in California, which I hope we will, that would correspond to 75,000 tests per day, exactly the kinds of numbers that Gavin Newsom talked about in his press conference yesterday um, afternoon. <coughs> What's the idea here? The idea is really super interesting. The claim that they make is that 
Well, first of all, our current testing is problematic in the sense that it's kind of analogous to being an Airbnb owner and going to your house once a week and then adjusting your thermostat and then leaving for a week and then coming back again in a week and adjusting again. And you know, you have a target temperature that you're, you're aiming for and you're, the, the current scheme of testing people that are symptomatic and, and present themselves is very different from the DNA-based random testing, which is the analogy on the right, which is you know, you're testing on the one day time scale and you can converge to an understanding of the situation much more quickly. Um, maybe just an aside, probably all of you know, that there's lots of different testing modalities that are in play. Um, the standard one is this one, but I really recommend people take a look at Sri Kosuri's uh, open story on swab seek, which may have legs as well. So coming back to this, um, green, the green horizontal line is the critical threshold above which um, you will overwhelm your healthcare system. And I have some slides on that that I'm not going to present unless somebody wants to talk about that. The, the idea of the blue horizontal dotted line and the gr green horizontal dotted line is the difference between daily testing and weekly testing. And, and basically the idea is you're measuring the local tangent vector. You're trying to find out the instantaneous growth rate and then using that to project uh, when you will reach your threshold. So it's what's unattractive about this idea is that it's sort of a World War II go to the bomb shelter mentality. You know, you do it when you have to, it's not uh, prescribed. And um, the second scenario is also very interesting. Again, I'm not giving this as advice. I'm more just doing it to, in case you haven't seen the paper. So this comes from Uri Alon and Ron Milo and uh, Yinon Baran and a few others. And I find it very intriguing. And it's basically trying to use the virus against itself. So if you look at our little piece on coronavirus by the numbers, you'll see that we tried to characterize some of the epidemiological parameters. One of them is the latent period, which is about four days. So here's their proposition. We go now to a two week uh, cyclic scheme in which we divided the population into two groups, the group one and the group two. Group one goes to work for four days, and let's say that it's uh, 12 or 13, 14 hour days, four days, and they, they work. Even if they're infected on the first day, on average, of course there's fluctuations, but on average, even if infected, they will not be infectious until they're in lockdown. Now they're in lockdown for 10 days, and during that time, they will pass through their peak infectious period, and on the other side, either they will have symptoms or not, if they don't have symptoms or didn't get infected, they will cycle back into work. And if they are sick, they will remain quarantined um, for uh, until they're better. Um, and then they'll inject back into their group. On week two, group two does this while group one is under quarantine. So this actually lowers the density of people in the workplace. It lowers the collisional cross-section and so on. So I'm basically done. Um, I would claim that there is a, a, a really pressing need for key numbers. So I've, as part of this coronavirus discussion group, I've been privy to all sorts of brilliant technologies, the sorts of things Manu Prakash is thinking about, using cotton candy machines to make new masks, using repurposing snorkeling masks. And, and I salute every single one of those innovative technological ideas. But exactly how I feel about the subject of biology writ large in the absence of coronavirus, measurements and numbers are not enough. As Poincaré said, uh, a science is built up of facts as a house is built up of bricks, but a mere accumulation of facts is no more a science than a pile of bricks is a house. Darwin said all observations should be for or against some uh, hypothesis to be of service. So here are some numbers that we don't know very well and that we need to know. Asymptomatic fraction, the viral bursting rate, the infection probability, the neutralization efficiency of antibodies, and also um, the viral fitness and, and what that does to things like the KDs and et cetera. And finally, the fraction of people harboring antibodies. Um, I tried to make this pitch. I don't know whether you liked the analogy or not, and maybe there's gonna be some people that will challenge it, but, um, but I had a few points in bringing up celestial mechanics. It was a long slog. It required good measurements. It required rigorous um, patient studies that had nothing to do with surprise that would get rejected from maybe even plus one. Again, I'm being a little bit ranty because I'm frustrated by this kind of stuff. Um, the viral mechanics thing, I'm not taking anything away from the 100 years of amazing effort that's been made. But that being said, um, we're, we're now right now being in a situation where there's lots of data for us to consider. 
So, um, so what was learned, I gave you, you know, kind of an overview of these various pieces of the book. Um, I wanted to note um, that if you want to take a look at it, uh, we, we tried very hard on this um, SARS-CoV-2 by the numbers paper. And what I like about the paper the most is the references. And this is something that actually that Ron and I have worked really hard on in the context of bio numbers and all the other papers we've written together. Often the appendices are my favorite parts. What we did in this one was we tried to not only point you to the reference, but the actual quote to the quote from within the reference that led to our conclusion about the numbers as were claimed by those that measured them. Um, you know, probably all of you know um, very well, probably many of you better than I, that, um, that these spillover events and pandemics are here to stay. They're, 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 they're a part of human history, and I think they're going to be insinuating our, themselves into our lives all the more. And just uh, to say again, um, this has been a, an amazing adventure with especially the, this two author teams. And um, with that, um, let me just end by saying that um, you know, I'm a, an amazing admirer of many of you at Genelia and at, at HHMI. It's a huge privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you. It's kind of Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz's fault. Uh, I talked to her family the other night. I'm a little bit nervous that I shouldn't have done this, but it's too late now, and I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, uh... Rob, okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm back, my video doesn't work for some reason. Um, uh, what, one thing, um, th th those were pretty minor, mild rants. Um, I, I can show you a thing or two about how- oh, Well, I'm how really to... good at it. I'm on my very best behavior. Uh, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> but it, it showed. <laughs> thank you, oh, that's a good um, <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, we got some questions here. Um, do, how reliable do you think the, um, the numbers that you tossed up about uh, latency period and infectious period are? Because I've been seeing, you know, I, I've been seeing some horror stories that maybe, maybe these are, are much bigger. Yeah. So what can I tell you? I mean, we, we worked really hard on that. And actually, a few days ago, Ron, I both have seen Uri Alon and also Ron pre uh, present about this. But I think Ron really gave a very um, careful statement about that. And what I guess I would say is that, first of all, their proposition for their scheme, you know, the 410, uh, does not have any intrinsic dependence on the 4, if you see what I mean. In other words, if you decided that you were wanted to be more cautious you could do two and 12 or something. What Ron had to say the other day, and I, I need to go dig around in the, the, the very rapidly changing literature, is that he would be very surprised if it's uh, shorter than three days. So that, that's my take. Um, there are for sure fluctuations, and maybe I would put this in the same category as a super spreader thing. What do I mean by that? You know, there's, there's people, so here's some numbers for you. At, uh, at the tests in the Bay Area from the people that I hang out with, um, the range of viral loads goes from 10 to the sixth per ml to some outliers with 10 to the ninth and one patient with 10 to the 12th. And the significance of that stuff, we don't know, you know, as of yet. We just don't know what the significance of those numbers is. So what I'm saying is that, it, could there be somebody that slid off of that 14 day period I, I would think absolutely yes, yeah. And how we come to terms with that is is uh, an important experimental question. And you know how we're going to get the answer to that, I don't exactly know. So I don't know if that was a useful answer. Oh no, no, that, that that was great. Um, so um, what what do you make of these reports of um, people testing positive after like sixty or seventy days? What what? What camp do you fall into on this? Yeah, so all, that's also interesting because I was on a call with uh, Steve Quake this morning. Um, and what I can tell you is that, the, and there's a relevance to this, which is there's two small communities. I think I, well, one of them is wide open. So I'll tell you one of them is Vashon Island in off of Seattle. And they've, they've basically mounted their own private testing thing. And what has come up is 
can somebody that's been infected get reinfected? And the, so what I'm telling you is from the people that do the sequencing that I've talked to, but this is not a, I'm not giving you a professional, like this is the right answer sort of opinion, which is um, that it was a matter of contamination. In other words, that it was not that somebody tested true positive twice, but instead that it was that they got tested correctly once. Um, I don't think I come down in that camp. I don't know what to, I don't know enough about the data to actually have a, an informed op opinion. So unfortunately, I'm going to keep on taking the fifth. Yeah, I, I mean the numbers of of such cases in in South Korea are you know seem sufficiently high that, you know, of the people testing positive again after some long amount of time, it, I don't know. It, it seems unlikely that all that would be contamination. I mean, I hope yeah, so. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So then that, you know, that brings me back, at least personally, it brings me back to the, the point about the antibodies and neutralization, you know, like, I don't know how often you watch the evening news, being all of you, but, you know, some nights I tune in and I'm really intrigued by the, and not happy with the isomorphism between antibodies present and immune. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, that, yeah, there, there's a lot of a lot of science behind that, right? If they're non-neutralizing, then they, they can even be worse than no antibodies at all. Um, yeah. And um, do, do you? I, mean, I guess the latest uh, number I saw for people recovering that don't seem to have any relevant, you know, any detectable antibody titer is that that's about thirty percent. I thought. Did you did you see some? What, what did you see? Wait, say that again. Oh, uh, of, of recovered cases that um, had really no detectable, I mean, certainly IgM was gone, but yeah. even no detectable IgG. Yeah, I don't want to say because I don't think I'm on top of it. It's something we've talked about, but I have to be honest, the thing that our gang has been obsessing on lately is the, uh, the, the Santa Clara and the LA antibody testing with the controversy about false positives. <laughs> yeah. That's what we've been focusing on. So I don't, I don't really know that, I don't carry those numbers around in my head well enough. I mean, I actually be really useful if you were to point me to the thing that, that I should look at. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll email you after this. Um, okay, uh, do you, would you recommend that places like Genelia, um, you know, that we implement the four plus 10? I'm well, so you know, Jennifer and I were talking about this the other day. I think it would be, and I'd love to be part of it actually, if you guys are game to do it. You know, I don't know, people are busy, but I think it'd be very interesting if you picked 10 of you, you know, a diverse group to at the very least assess the, the propositions that are out there other than the Groundhog Day proposition. You know, like <laughs> you and I talked about that earlier. So for, for everyone in the audience, you know, again, I'm hoping that many of you are my friends and are going to contact me afterwards, but what I keep asking people, you know, is what we're getting ready to do literally nothing more than just say, well, let's just go back to March 1st and try again and see if it turns out differently. Um, and I fear that, like, you know, I was talking to people in Montana today, I feel that that's maybe what they're getting ready to do. So, um, I think it would be worth your time to have a discussion about if you were to be proactive what would that look like? One of the problems that you and I talked about before the, the talk was the, the proposition depends on people in the household being synchronized. So it's like all in. If people are gonna do it, then that means that you're, the HHMI family is gonna have to buy into the idea that everybody's gonna go into the four on, 10 off, four, in, four on, 10 off, and be the experimental subjects, you know? And I don't know how much patience people have for that nor how much flexibility they have for it but i do think it's worth um your while the other thing i was telling lauren before the talk that will be of interest to everybody is with respect to this swiss proposition um there are a lot I, i've gathered from our coronavirus discussion group there's a lot of companies that are hemorrhaging a lot of money and they are getting to the point where they are interested in setting up their own testing to the tune of testing every employee every day and so you know that kind of thing i think is very interesting and um, so, yeah, I, if you guys make a committee, I think it would be very worth your while to, to delve into um, this stuff. And I, I also will tell you, anybody that wants to 
uh, join into our uh, coronavirus discussion group, the Swiss guys are going to make a presentation to us next week. So if, if somebody wants to hear an overview, probably not 160 people, but maybe right. if uh, you know five or ten of you want to join in. Oh, okay. Uh, hey, can you great. send me? Can you send me the link after this? Yeah, let, let, yeah. Let's okay. exchange an email about it. And, okay. Um, yeah. Here we got a couple questions about sero prevalence. Um, what what do you make of a um, a report suggesting that uh, twenty percent of New York City is sero positive? Does does that sound plausible to you? Hmm. Okay, let me try to reason it out. I haven't done the calculation. I have done the calculation of, of deaths. So what do I mean by that? I've been, been trying to understand the annual birth and death rate in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, in, New, in LA, it's something like 165 to 200 per day. And um, probably all of you saw on the New York Times, but we had already done these calculations ourselves. If you take the, the 2019 plus the reported deaths, it is not equal to the number of deaths and it's off by like a good solid big chunk. And so, um, so what I've been doing is just trying to get a sense of, um, of what the number of total cases is and then deaths and how it relates to the confirmed cases. And so what worries me is that the Santa Clara report said 50 to 85 times more than confirmed, right? That was the version of that. So yeah, I, I mean that that paper got taken down pretty thoroughly. It, it was agreed. very shoddily executed. So yeah, so fair enough. So so then my question is, um, I guess what I would think is that at least in California, that maybe the upper limit is like four percent, but New York City is another matter. So what is the number yeah. of confirmed there? Like, is it uh, two hundred? Well, what is it? I don't remember. Like sixty, a hundred thousand cases. Yeah, I don't know, but they, I mean, so 10 to the fifth over, to, so that's one in a hundred of are confirmed. Yeah, no, right? I, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm doing an order of magnitude estimate. So 10 million people, <laughs> 10 to the seventh, 10 to the fifth is number of confirmed. That's one in a hundred. So I would be, I, I that 20% is starting to sound like the 50, uh, the 50 to 85 excess factor on Santa Clara County. And, you know, I don't know what all of you guys have done, but with respect to the, the, um, the Ben David study, our gang had a presentation the other day, a Bayesian estimation. Yeah. And the, the number of false positives was between two and 48. And the number they reported was 50. So yeah. 50 out of the 3,300. And we, so, so the analysis was like somewhere in the, the range of two to 48 is false positives. So I don't know, I guess I'm suspicious of the, of the, the 20%. And I guess, you know, I would say to all of you as people that are, many of you are experimentalists is, um, when are these tests gonna, when are they gonna settle down where we're all like, yeah, we buy that number? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, okay, here, here are two questions that dovetail nicely together. Yeah. Um, uh, so what did we learn from uh, such modeling analyses on previous epidemics? Uh, the questioner says SARS-1, um, but, you know, I'd say also from influenza um, that are helping us now. And what are we learning? What, what numbers should we make, pay closest attention to in this pandemic such that, you know, when this happens again in 15 years, we, we don't mess it up quite so badly? Yeah. So I, I, I'll try to not be too long-winded, but um, as you and I talked about, uh, before the talk, um, I think that it's really important that people be in a marathoner mentality. And both for this particular, however long we're about to suffer this, but for the fact that this is coming again. Um, so I appreciate the spirit of that question. That's the first thing. The next thing I wanna say is that, um, you know, I feel like Janelia HHMI required reading is every single person should read The Great Influenza by John Barry. I really in, honestly believe that. And you know, if there are people on here like, that are my friends, like Jennifer or Ron Vale or whatever, they know I'm a big reader and I read a lot of stuff, but I can't tell you how strongly I think that people should read that in Spillover by David Quammen. So um, if, you, if you go poke around on influenza, um, there's a guy named, I think it's Markle. He's a professor at Michigan. And I think he does the history of 
of epidemics and stuff. And I've, I've been reading a lot of things he has to say, and I think he has smart things to say. There was even an editorial by John Barry, um, the guy that wrote The Great Influence. And there's also been something with David Quammen, um, who, who you know foresaw this. There's a very interesting series on Netflix, Pandemic, and I forgot the guy's name, which is the reason I'm telling you you have to look at the series. Um, he's been spending his time in, uh, in China. So a lot of people have been already looking over the horizon. The reason that I find the Great Influenza book so disturbing is that I just look at it and I'm, I feel like I'm just watching what's happening right now. This guy, yeah. Lip, Mark, I think it's Mark Lipsitch, who's at Harvard. Yeah, yeah. He had a science paper, you know, but he also has thought hard about the 1918 uh, influenza. So now let me see if I can formalize, while you're, maybe you're gonna ask about, see if I can formalize something more useful to say, but it's very discouraging in a way. Um, <laughs> In yeah. the sense that you know those who, can, who uh, forget history are condemned to repeat it, or all we learn from the history yeah. is we learn nothing from history. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of weird. Yeah. So, um, is there something that you would add? Um, you know, not just uh, you know general points that we learned from um, nineteen eighteen or now, but you know specifically to the point of modeling and. Uh, fo you know, forecasting, you know, how does the particular kind of work that you talked about today, how do we do that better um, when it yeah. happens in 15 years? And yeah. Okay, oh. good. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. So I'm going to, I'm going to hearken back for a moment to celestial mechanics and to weather. And then I will, I will tackle it in the context of the pandemic. Okay. I mean, what I want to say is that um, is that, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the resolution of the experiments just got better and better and better. People got better and better at measuring the position of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and all that. Ditto for um, weather. So, you know, I, we can get off on a, a discussion of Lorentz and chaos, but the point is the spatio-temporal resolution of our weather measurements are better and better and better all the time. And, you know, what I can tell you as a guy who's a surfer is that people spend actually, you know, young guys that don't have that much money spend actual money based on forecasts that Mavericks is going to be big on a certain day, and it is. In other words, they know when to go to the North Shore of Oahu. They know when to go to the North, the, the Northern California and stuff. They know when Puerto Escondido is going to be breaking. It's just to say that the, the forecasting has been done really well. So in light of that, what I would say is that there's this notion, and you can go search on it, of, of global virome. And it's in a way, the, the genome of the planet is the way Eddie Rubin likes to describe it, and probably others do as well. And, you know, they've already been at this. So they've, I think it was called PREDICT. It yeah. was a precursor to, the, to global virome. And, and actually, you know, the naysayers were saying, oh, you know, that's a waste. Why are we going to do that? I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that that uh, the naysaying is going to be over now, but it's a very, very interesting study. They're basically, you know, like, what is, what do you conclude from that? Like more people should go to veterinary school yeah, and more people should learn how to work on animals. More people should be in the field. You know, you have to be brave to be out there going in bat caves and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of dedicated people that are doing that kind of stuff. So I think that the, the data side of the story is hyper important. Mm -hmm. modeling side of the story you know now I'm going to go back to my rant you know I just <laughs> truly I truly believe that biology writ large does not have a proper respect for theory they have a wrong idea of what wrong is about you know like in physics we proudly teach tons of wrong ideas about the specific heat of solids and I have taught them myself and I will keep teaching them proudly you know so being wrong is not a badge of shame and then the final point is that the, the experiment theory dialogue, it, you know, I, I love showing the 15 different measurements of Avogadro's number. You know, reviewer three will reject it and say, person already, you know, why are you using black body radiation to measure Avogadro's number? It's already been done by diffusion or whatever. And so, you know, that's, those are attitudinal corrections for us as a culture of science. And I think our attitude sucks. And I'm being completely honest. I think we have no patience for careful, patient, rigorous, boring, not surprising, get it right stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that was an answer. So, you know, I think we need to be replaying the tape of this pandemic. You know, we need to, maybe we need to have 
you know, we have to have to have more careful examples, even in bacterial settings of, of phages interacting with, uh, with bacteria, you know, a la Linsky, trying yeah. to set up and understand viral dynamics in model systems, you know, things like that. And that's not to say people aren't doing that. You know, people like Paul Rainey have done work like that. And so has Linsky himself. But I'm just saying, you know, like rigorous theory experiment dialogue. That's my particular take. Yeah. I don't know how many people share it. Uh, awesome. Okay, let me just, uh, just one or two more here. Um, here's a really practical one. Um, yeah. So what, you know, we're way behind on testing. We, we were way behind, we are behind. Etc. Um, well, you know, is it PCR that we need to focus on? Um, what you know, what is the role of seroprevalence assays going to be in getting us in us riding the ship? Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And and what's the what in your mind is the the rate limiting step? Um, you yeah. know, in getting testing to where it needs to be. Yeah. Okay. So this comes back also to what you guys can do. Like I, I'm very interested in, in you as an ecosystem and also an, as an eco, a privileged <laughs> ecosystem with some money. Um, so uh, the first thing I would say is that I am not a professional in this world and I really wanna make sure that that's crystal clear. So anything I say should be taken with a grain of salt. If I were in charge, you know, like if I were sitting in Aaron O'Shea's seat, you know, and this is by no means advice, but I'm just saying if I were doing that, I would be obsessed with testing people to find out if they are sick and not whether they're antibody positive. And my reason is because if, if it's 4% max in California, you know, I showed you those SIR curves and we're all brainwashed, at least I'm brainwashed by thinking of the susceptible as doing this. <laughs> yeah. The susceptible is a flat line. Yeah. Nobody's been infected. I mean, okay, that's, a, that's maybe not a, a legitimate assertion, but it's my, I'm, that's my working hypothesis is nobody has been infected basically as yet. Yeah. So for me, if I were sitting in the boss's chair, I would be in the category of those business uh, CEOs who'd be saying, look, we're hemorrhaging money. We're gonna test everybody every day, period. And that's how I would ride the ship. And you know, I'm a kind of adventurous guy. So I would be pretty interested in getting my little committee together and saying, yeah. what do you guys think about this wild Israeli proposition? Like, dare we? dare we go down that path you know yeah. i would definitely begin to think about yeah. doing it myself yeah but i have no idea whether people have the the stomach for it but i would not be excited about the groundhog day proposition i think that's <laughs> stupid yeah we, we so, don't want that uh, I'm, I'm very very frustrated by that proposition i have to say and you know i'm open to being convinced that that's not what's going to happen but okay it's groundhog day plus masks yeah um, all right, what, uh, last one here. Um, you, you said you bet that Florida wasn't right. Uh, what, what do you mean? Well, so what I meant, yeah, I'm really happy that you brought that up, is um, it's a hypothesis. My working hypothesis is that uh, physical distancing matters. Like it's, it is the, it's the vaccine that we have. Yep. They have been, they were not, so look at the difference between California and Florida. Yeah. We have largely been an example in California of early action and high discipline. And Florida was people on the beaches going crazy and whatever. Plus the demographic of Florida is a bunch of New Yorkers that are over the age of 70. Yeah. So I just feel like uh, the, the projection at that, that plateau, this is a personal opinion, I, you know, it's a marathon. So I, I made the dinner bet for the, the you know, the, year time scale I, it's just very hard for me to imagine it's going to play out so yeah. gently yeah that was my instinct no I, I i happen to agree oh yeah i'll see well yeah. rob thank you very much thanks uh those of you that are buddies of mine if you feel like chatting i'm delighted to do so i again it's a huge privilege to have uh, interacted with you it's very weird i have no idea who was here or anything but anyway <laughs> good yeah, luck I to everyone all right, man. All right, Thank keep you. up your work. Ciao. All right, ciao. Bye.